Welcome, art lovers. I'm your host, Taylor, and today we are going to dive into the exciting world of all things visual art created by artificial intelligence. Have you ever been on social media and like used a filter to make yourself into a cartoon character and seen a photo that looks so real you couldn't believe it was computer generated? Well, what if I told you that everything I just said was created by AI? I know, freaky, right? Just by typing a sentence or two into an AI machine, artists have been able to create beautiful digital works. So beautiful that an AI-generated piece actually won first prize at an art competition. Still, not everyone is super excited about this technology. Why? Well, in this episode, we will chat with experts and artists at the cutting edge of this innovative technology and figure out what's in store for us when it comes to AI and art. The drama with AI, uh, wow, that's a, that's a big one. Who's this? Oh, this is Curie. Curie's one of the bots that we have roaming around in the Adaptive Context Environments Lab. Hey, Curie. And I can, you know, pat Curie on the head and Curie will react to that and start purring. Oh my gosh, <laughs> it, it, it like purred. Try it. Yeah, go like, ahead and pat like Curie on the head. Like a little kitty cat. Hi, Curie. We are at OCAD University with Dr. Alexis Morris. Can you tell us a little bit more about your work and what you do? I'm the Tier 2 Canada Research Chair in the Internet of Things. And so I think about what it's going to be like to be in the world where the environment can come alive mm -hmm. and can express itself through technologies like mixed reality, how artificial intelligence not only takes in information from the world, but can also um, react in different ways. What are some examples of ways that AI is already present in our lives? Artificial intelligence is something that we've been engaging with, you know, in the background of our different tasks. Uh, if you're trying to use a keyboard on your phone and you have predictive typing turned on, the music recommendation example is a really nice one in terms of helping us to discover new things that we may not have already been aware of. Can you walk me through what text-to-image AI is? You can input a prompt to produce an image. And so if, if we're thinking about the prompt, a cat in a hat, now the AI generator can express a cat in a hat and many different cats in, in hats. There's billions. Billions, But yes. for me, like, I think I know that there's a black cat and a gray cat and like maybe like a blonde cat. Yeah, that's right. And there's, there's, there's more there. You know, when you mentioned uh, a blonde cat, I thought about a cat with a wig. How do these AI generators work? There's a process we call classification. Being able to go from, you know, language to a thing, and then generation, what that thing looks like. Classification. You show the machine an image of a cat, but it doesn't know what a cat is. So when you give it the picture, you also tell the machine, this is a cat. Now that it's already seen a cat, it might try to guess if a picture is a cat or not, but with only one example, it won't be very good at guessing. So you give it lots of pictures of cats, and after a time, it starts to learn that cats are often a little fuzzy and have pointed ears. As you give it more and more pictures, the machine figures out more and more features, most of which are extremely abstract and not really understandable by people. Usually by the time a machine can figure out if something is a cat or not reliably, there will be hundreds of different features a machine has identified. Generation, this is how the AI actually produces the image from the classification image that it's learned from. We do this by adding noise. We can think of adding noise as removing information from an image. And what the AI has learned to do is how to guess what these missing pieces of information are and fill them in until it finds the right match to finish the picture. If you do this multiple times with a machine with multiple pictures of cats and you add more and more noise until there's no more of the original image left, it can eventually learn how to create images of cats from nothing at all. 
The thing is, the machine needs a lot of images of cats in order to do this. If you give the same image of one cat over and over, it will get good at drawing just that one same cat. But in order to get it to draw cats in general, like any kind of cat you want, maybe even playing the piano, <laughs> you need a massive amount of images. Hundreds of millions, even billions of, of cats. Now we can put in a prompt. What should we put in? We were talking about cats and hats. Let's do cyberpunk nice. cats in hats. And what type of hats do you want? Or should we just like see? Well, we, it has to be cyberpunk hats. We could make it even more specific. We could put them in a street. We can put them in a subway. On buying milk. Buying milk in, in a cyberpunk a convenience store. store. It can't just be a regular store. That looks like so real. <gasps> First though, so we got <laughs> A couple different generations what? of cyberpunk cats wearing cyberpunk hats. Yeah. OK, so what if we go one step further? Mm -hmm. What if we put ourselves into that cyberpunk cat wearing cyberpunk hat world? OK, I'm down. <laughs> OK, so first we need a photo. So we just have to type in cats in cyber hats. So we generate. So the system is going to go through the process of taking that prompt and that starting image mm -hmm. and trying to represent it. Oh, <gasps> there we go. This is scary. <laughs> so that is a really, really Where fantastic. Where are you? <laughs> I am somewhere there in the background. <laughs> What have you got in your hand there? Uh, just a couple little uh, prints of uh, my artwork. Characters I created uh, called uh, Guardian Sprites. I call myself a multimedia illustrator where, uh, you know, I sort of dabble in a lot of different mediums. The, the Guardian Sprites, which are more uh, like traditional illustration. And then there's my other work that I call inked photography. It's photographs that I've taken like of abandoned buildings and then add creatures to the photo with inks right onto the photo. So you have like that traditional like sketching and the drawing and then you're kind of using technology. Technology, <laughs> Technology. Yes. Yeah. Was there something that like inspired you to kind of intersect those two ways of of creating? So I was kind of envisioning like a lot of the abandoned locations, like if there's spirits roaming the hallways, you know, or kind of playing with the idea too of uh, maybe some past traumatic events or something mm -hmm. that have happened there and mental health and stuff. Kind of mixing things up a little. I think that that's just a really important thing to address when you're talking about your art and you're not the only person that I think sees that because you have, what is it, 17K followers? Uh, almost 20,000 followers. Almost 20,000 followers, slay, that's fantastic. Yeah, people sort of identifying with the imagery that I was putting out and it really sort of opened dialogue with a lot of people and they found that my art page was like a safe space for them to express that. Tell me the drama with AI. The drama with AI, uh, wow, that's a that's a big one. Well, the big drama right now, especially how it affects me, is that these AI programs are scraping artwork off the internet, uh, including my own, and Frankensteining them into a piece of artwork. You know, using my style and, and other artists' styles mm -hmm. that people can download for a fee and reuse however they'd like. It really upset me, you know, that I was one of those artists that got scraped up, you know, by, by the AI uh, apps. It's a little disheartening to know that something that you created can be sort of scooped up and regurgitated. And regurgitated. It borders on like consent. Yeah, well, yeah, you, you feel kind of violated in a way. Like it's kind of like when somebody breaks into your home and, and takes off with your television or your PlayStation or something, you know, it's, it's an exciting time. Yeah. Like it's interesting what's happening. Like, I mean, the technology is amazing, mm -hmm. but what's wrong with these companies coming to the artists and saying, we'd like to work with you. You know, let's make a partnership. Mm -hmm. You know, why, why not make a marriage of the two? And, you know, down the road, maybe it'll, it'll be a more uh, equitable sort of technology. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, it isn't. Hi, Waxhead. Thanks so much for meeting with me. How are you? I'm good. Staying on a little, little island in uh, the south of Cambodia. I'm painting some murals for some local guest houses. It's fun to see such a vibrant place with so much creativity. 
What is your relationship with street art? How did you find it? What drew you to it? It all started with graffiti when I was very young. Saw a lot of art on freight trains. I lived right next to a train yard in Toronto and that really inspired me to start doing my own thing. How did you start using AI in your work? What was that relationship and journey like? So I'm using AI in a, in a wide variety of ways as a tool to create uh, seamless textures for 3D models, to create reference material for my murals, to create references for paintings. Now I'm using it to create videos where I'm taking existing videos that I have and iterating on, on prompts to create new content. It just allowed me to be creative and to, to learn and kind of like renewed like a love for learning. So how do you combine all of these different technologies and tools to create your work? It's been a fun challenge for me to combine uh, both my painting and outdoor work and the digital work I've been learning and creating. The digital work is still very much a process, finding different ways where I can combine the two worlds together through things like projection mapping has been uh, really fascinating for me. I bet it can feel like a double-edged sword sometimes because on one hand you have the virality and the traction, but on the other hand you have folks that can be taken advantage of. I do feel a bit of compassion for the artists that are, have been had their work scraped. I did look at that website that found that has AI art, you know, what art is being used to train some of the models. And I saw that they used a lot of old stuff from, from the Flickr days. I think humans have always used other artwork as references and we're all taking our inspirations from somewhere. So it's just that now the skill level to learn this style of artwork is a lot more approachable. I'm starting to build models that are referencing my art. So I'm using hundreds and hundreds of photographs of years and years and years of my work to make something that's that's my style, that's Waxhead, but also created by AI. There's plenty of artists doing this nowadays that are using these models in such creative ways that without the human, human involvement wouldn't be possible. I didn't even think about that. That's a really cool way to kind of like flip the script in a sense. I think as an artist, you still need to input your own creative passions and your own creative skills. I think there's important to find the medium ground within within all those aspects of using art that, that you yourself have created and mixing it with these AI models. Where do you see AI and tech and art going? I think for what the future holds with AI is I see a lot of artists producing their own models, being able to create new bodies of work within their specific niche styles. I think there's a lot of power in that. How do you think it can be made accessible and useful and just fairly for everyone? Things are changing extremely fast. I'm excited about the future using AI, using text prompts. What concerns me is, is who controls these models, right? If they're private companies, which the majority of them are at this point, this is definitely going to skew things in a certain way and in a certain direction where I think uh, more open source AI models that are controlled by the public, I think in terms of art and creativity are going to have vastly more amazing applications in general. We are at the frontier of AI and visual art, and with how quickly this technology is changing, so are our opinions and understandings of this new technology. And for artists like Mark, the future for him is hinged upon the discussions that we're having right now. Despite this uncertainty, we've learned that from Waxhead, when used in a transformative way, this technology is a real opportunity for artists to push the boundaries of their possibilities and create really cool art. And if that's the future of digital art, then sky's the limit. At least whatever sky the AI has already been trained with. Join me in our next episode as we discover more innovative ways of creating art.